many of you that are in the on the pavement side know of or know Jim through different um, conferences you might travel to around the country. Jim is is very active in not only the pavement industry but in the asset management industry as a whole. Jim is uh, a senior consultant with Fugro. He's also the executive director of FP2. He is a uh, registered professional engineer in multiple states. He's a former state pavement engineer in Pennsylvania, I believe. And um, Jim serves on many uh, national committees and working groups in both payment and asset management. And I want you to join me in welcoming Jim uh, for his presentation. Jim Malker. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jim, and, and good morning. A little apology to uh, some of our international friends that were here because I'm basically going to be talking about some of the current transportation legislation that uh, governs a lot of what some of most of you do. Um, some people refer to it as making sausage in Washington. Uh, probably, maybe not quite that bad, but on the order of things like that. Um, so that uh, also to remind you that, uh, as, as I was recently reminded, that this is really not a presentation as much as it is a conversation. So if you got questions while I'm going through here, just uh, interrupt me, that's not a problem. Um, but as, because it's a conversation, I get to start first. And then uh, you get to follow up. So what we're gonna talk about is uh, the implications of MAP 21, which is uh, making progress for the 21st century, the, not the current legislation in Washington, but which led up to the current legislation, which is called the FAST Act, uh, Fixing America's Surface Transportation System and how it may affect you as an asset manager in the organization that you work with. And you may find out when I get all finished here that uh, maybe it doesn't affect you at all. But uh, hopefully this will give you some food for thought about some of the things that are important here. So what am I gonna talk about? First of all, you know, who is FP2? What does that mean? Uh, what do we do? Uh, the definition uh, by Ashto of asset management, most of you probably know that by heart, MAP 21, I'll go into some of the details of that because the FAST Act was really a springboard uh, from MAP 21. The FAST Act, of course, and what does this mean to asset managers and what can you do in terms of moving forward? So what is FP2? As you see here, it's an industry-supported trade organization. We're a... Uh, a an association, if you will, like a lot of other associations, such as uh, the National Asphalt Paving Association, um, International Grinding and Grooving Association, et cetera, et cetera. Those are some of the people who support us. What's the purpose? You can see it here. Mainly, uh, we've been involved in the pavements area. As it says, there are nation's transportation infrastructure, but it obviously, if we're involved at all with asset management, we have to be in inclusive of all, all the other modes and the other things that go on in terms of our nation's infrastructure. Who supports us? Uh, associations, as I mentioned, contractors like Colos and Intermountain Slurry Seal and All States Materials Group and people like that. Some of you may be familiar with them. Material suppliers like Aragon Asphalt and Refining, asphalt materials, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, chemical suppliers like BASF and Axo Nobel and Ingevity and Midwest Vaco, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, equipment manufacturers like Birdcamp and Wirtgen and others. Uh, so it, it's kind of a, a pretty good compilation of industry folks who firmly believe that 
taking care of our infrastructure is important, not only for their business, but it's important to move goods and services around this country. And so they're very active in supporting our operations and what we try to do in that regard. Also consultants, I might mention as well. So what do we do? Our mission, three things. The first one is advocacy to educate public officials at all levels, whether it's national, state, or local, uh, in, in terms of why it's important to have our infrastructure and what, what the needs are and why it's important to keep, keep those infrastructure situation the way it should be. And we're also quite involved with legislation, and I'll get into that when I discuss uh, MAP 21 and the FAST Act. Research. We also support and fund research. Um, we are, we're a full funding partner with the National Center, for Asphalt, National Center for Asphalt Technology 2012 uh, Preservation Group Study that was conducted at Auburn, Alabama, and the 2015 NCAT and Minroad Preservation Group Project that's currently being just completed construction in Minnesota uh, the work was done in, in Alabama as part of that study, and I'll discuss it a little bit here. And then finally, communication. So advocacy, research, and communication. We sponsor key events. We publish the Pavement Preservation Journal. Uh, latest one just came out a couple weeks ago. It looks like this. Uh, quarterly publication, usually some uh, case studies, some, some uh, history of things, uh, various treatments, et cetera. Um, so it's free. If you'd like a copy of it, give me your business card or give me a note with your name and address on it and I'll make sure you get a copy. Um, we distribute uh, educational materials again. Um, and one of the things that we do is to recognize agencies uh, that have an excellent pavement preservation program. And uh, we present an award annually named the James B. Sorensen Award. Jim. I uh, passed away several years ago, but he was a very passionate person within Federal Highway Office of Infrastructure regarding pa pavement preservation, and we've named the award after him. Actually, the award will be, this year, will be presented at the National Pavement Preservation Conference in Nashville two weeks from now uh, to Ohio DOT for their, for their submission. Uh, there were several different submissions, uh, proposals that are submitted to us they're judged and we decide on, on who the best uh, is. So that, again, that'll be presented in uh, Nashville. Regarding advocacy and a little bit more drill down into that, we have a contract with uh, a legal firm that's also a lobbying firm in Washington called Williams & Jensen. Uh, we're probably the smallest group that they represent. Um, they represent companies like Dell, Coca-Cola, United Airlines, uh, FP2 isn't up there in the top list in terms of uh, our contributions to their efforts, but nonetheless, they represent us. And uh, we uh, were very active in advocating for pavement preservation language in MAP 21 and to make sure that it continued in the FAST Act and didn't get replaced with something else. Uh, over 200 meetings since about 2009 on Capitol Hill with House and Senate Transportation Committees, and as well as key congressional members and, and their staff. Most of those meetings took place with staff uh, because they're the ones who actually write the bills, uh, even though the legislatures themselves might be interested in it, have some value to it, but it's, it's the staffers who really get the job done, and that's who we've spent a lot of time with. Um, it, as we began in 2009, and the, the reason for this was because paper preservation activities weren't eligible in every state uh, for federal funding. It depended on the division administrator's office as to whether they would say, this is okay, you can use federal funds for those activities, or you can't. So we felt that it was important from an industry perspective to get it codified that it would be in the law that these types of treatments whether they be thin asphalt treatments, thin concrete treatments, whatever the case might be, that they would be eligible for federal funds. And so it took a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of visits to make this thing happen. B 
because as you can imagine, going into a staffer, Capitol Hill, who's their transportation person, and say, we'd like to talk to you about pavement preservation. And the deer in the headlights look kind of turned you on real quick. I have no idea what you're talking about. Would you please explain to me what your, what you, what your issue is? To the point where one of them said to me, how do you build a road anyhow? And I thought he was kidding. And I thought, I thought well, I, are you serious? And he said, yes, I'm serious. And I said, okay, well, there's a whiteboard here, and here's the, here's the pen. Go ahead and start and draw all the things that go into making a road. And so it was not only an education for the staff, and, and it was a very, very big education for us, too, to get our act together, to really to make sure that our message was very clear and coherent as to what we were trying to accomplish by getting pavement preservation built into the law. And again, it, it, took, it took a lot of time to do that. In terms of uh, research, uh, on the left you see a shot of uh, the Minnesota Min Road project. This is their uh, low volume part of it. But you see here three lanes. There's, this is I-94 north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And uh, they can move real traffic off the interstate and move it on to another portion of the interstate and put real live traffic on their test sections. So this is a Min Road, you probably have heard of it, read about it in the literature and so on and so forth, but it's, it's been around for a, a long time, a lot of very excellent work done by the, by the DOT there. Uh, this is the track at, at the NCAT in Auburn, Alabama. It's about a mile or so. Uh, most of the test sections are in these tangents. Uh, there are some in friction areas in these curves, but uh, the collaboration between the two of them the first study I mentioned was done in 2012, and we put a 25 different treatments down. They ranged anything from a fog seal to a chip seal to a, a microsurfacing to thin overlays with various products in them and so forth. 23 different test sections, two control sections, and some of the data started to be reported out, and people would say, well, you know, gee, I, I'm in North Dakota. What, what does anything have to do in Alabama going to affect me? I, you know, I, I just don't understand how the performance properties of those materials in that kind of a situation, climate, how it affects us. What, what, do we, what does it mean to us? So there began a collaboration between NCAT and Minroad to say maybe we could do the same types of treatments in the north and do the, as we do in the south and then compare the results and see how they operate you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the last two years, there were 40 different test sections of various material types, uh, emulsion-based products for the most part, but also thin hot mix overlays, et cetera, that were placed on US 169 in Minnesota and also a county road, low volume, high volume, as well as US 280 in Alabama, about 17,000 ADT, uh, 10 or 12% trucks to try to see how these how these products perform, because the intention is to be able to add to the literature to say, what's the, what are the improvements to the system itself and to the particular project with the use of these types of products? Do they actually add to the service life and so forth? And if they do, how much? Can we quantify it? Because if you go to the literature, you won't find anything much like that. You'll find a lot of anecdotal data, but not really a lot of real data. Our communication efforts, as I mentioned before, about our, our magazine, we also have a website like most everybody else, so that's, that's no big deal. Uh, we financially support the National Center for Pavement Preservation at Michigan State. It's been there since 2002. And we work with the regional centers, uh, the pavement preservation partnerships that Jim mentioned around the country and FHWA, we have a very good working relationship with the Office of Infrastructure with Federal Highway. So asset management as defined by, Ash, by Ashto, you see here, um, I've underlined some things that I think probably are important, but you know a lot better about that than I do. But certainly, uh, as Steve talked about earlier, some of the most important things that get built into the asset management operations and so forth. Better decision making, I guess, is the bottom line. So map 21, moving ahead for progress in the 21st century. 
MAP 21 occurred, uh, actually was signed into law, I believe I have it here, July of 2012. Before that, the previous highway legislation was called Safety Lou, and there were, I believe, 31 continuing resolutions to that act that finally led to MAP 21. Continuing resolution is you know, in a easy parlance, kicking the can down the road. But what it means is the Congress gets together and said, well, we'll just continue to fund at the same level the law that's on the books now because we can't come to grips with how we resolve this issue and do something better. 31 times they did that, roughly. So as you can imagine, there were a number of people involved in the House and Senate within the U.S. Congress that had were instrumental in a lot of these activities, either not getting done or trying to get things done. So it finally happened in, in July of 2012. Uh, Representative Micah from Florida was the House uh, Transportation Infrastructure Committee chair who did a lot to get this law in place. However, from a planning asset management perspective, it was a 27-month bill, uh, $120 billion, and it expired in 2014. Not much of a planning horizon in 27 months. Um, so the issue was, what are we going to do now? How are we going to, in fact, uh, try to use the impetus that was built to get MAP 21 done and get a Transportation Act that was more meaningful from a planning perspective and for a lot of perspectives. So it, on the other hand, it consolidated about two-thirds of uh, FHWA's programs from something like 104 down to 10 or 12 or something like that. A very significant change in um, the transportation programs at the national level. It created a new national performance program and uh, has been discussed here and will be continued to be discussed. It required asset management plans and pavement performance standards. Pavement performance standards uh, as a result of MAP 21, which uh, expired, as I said, in 2014, but it was enacted in July of 2012. So there's been act they've been working on, FHWA has been working on these performance standards since about the end of 2012. It's my understanding this morning that uh, it's already over at the Office of Management and Budget, uh, which is a requirement before it becomes uh, regulation. And so the anticipation is that those performance standards for payments will be finally issued probably in December of this year, after several years of work trying to get there. So, uh, as part of it, as I mentioned earlier, it explicitly recognized that pavement preservation activities were eligible for federal funding. However, as part of the deal, it required an infusion of $13 billion from the general fund. And that's not the first time that the highway bill has had general fund money transfers put into it to keep it solvent into the highway trust fund. But the amount that was required, MAP 21, for that 27-month period was $13 billion. And as we'll see, when we get to the FAST Act, that, uh, that that's a small pittance compared to what the numbers really are going to be eventually. So at this time last year, uh, anybody who thought there was going to be a transportation bill was, was crazy. It wasn't going to happen. Uh, there was too many things in, impacting Congress their activities, uh, their non-activities, maybe some of you feel. Um, that uh, nonetheless, uh, <clears throat> there were lots of little, little spurs in there and so forth. At any rate, up, up comes uh, uh, Sen uh, Representative Schuster from Pennsylvania, who's the chair of the Transportation Committee in, in the House, and uh, Senator Boxer from California, who was the Environmental and Public Works Chair in the Senate, uh, got together and decided, you know, we're gonna make this thing happen. And so the administration had put forth a bill earlier in the year called the DRIVE Act. Uh, you know, there's an there has to be an organization in Washington that's strictly around for acronyms. Uh, that's, their, that's their entire job is to figure out 
how I can take something and make it into a flashy acronym and mean what it's supposed to relate to. It's kind of interesting how that works. So the DRIVE Act, I forget what it was for, but we ended up with the FAST Act. But uh, nonetheless, it happened. Uh, it passed Congress in December of last year. Um, it's a five-year bill. Hmm. No, not a 27-month bill now, but a five-year bill provided needing funding certainty over that five-year period uh, under several provisions, as we'll see in a few minutes. Um, it increased the annual spending investments uh, from 40 to 46 billion, as you see, and that's about a 20 billion increase over, five, over that five-year period. The other thing it does is it gives an agency a, a much better planning window on what can be accomplished, how the money is going to be there, et cetera, et cetera, as compared to things as they've occurred in the past. 5% um, increase, and uh, you'll see increases ranging from, as you see, 2.1, 2.4 from 2017 on uh, to 2020 when the bill expires. And um, there were certain things that uh, were, were part of that. One of the major emphasis areas um, in the deliberations about the FAST Act and before its final passage was freight and the, the, the idea of moving goods and services around the country, whether they're on roads or railroads or airlines or whatever the case might be, but the importance to the economy of this country to be able to move goods and services in a very efficient way. And so there was a lot of attention paid to the, uh, to the freight part of this act. And um, so you'll see there the National Freight Program. And uh, I have to refer to my notes to be able to give you the, the, the real scoop on this. But um, it distributed uh, $6.2 billion uh, to states by formula. And, but the states have to establish a, a freight advisory commission and develop a, straight, a state freight management plan before the funds can be obligated. So certain things have to happen before that money is actually available to the states. Um, there will be a, a national freight uh, network comprised of interstate highways, and they want to be the fact that they're key to safe and efficient shipment of freight and goods and so forth. Uh, additionally to there, there was a nationally significant freight and highway projects program, which is a 900 million per year in large scale grants. In other words, there is a competitive grant program, which is a little bit different than normal, for projects of at least $25 million that improve movement of both freight and people increase competitiveness, reduce bottlenecks, and improve intermodal connectivity. And there's a 60% federal match. So their federal grants to the tune of 900 million per year, but there's a, also a matching requirement by the states. So there's a 60-40, 60% federal, 40% state. Um, there are another, uh, other interesting aspects of the FACTS Act that uh, you may be interested in. One of the things was federal permitting improvement. Uh, it supposedly will decrease the lag time by doing things like enduring simultaneous, not sequential reviews. So that's another aspect of the FAST Act to try to move things quicker, to get products out quicker. There was also uh, was a big emphasis on everyday counts. This is a program that's been, FHWA program that's been around for maybe uh, five or six years. Um, it, it, uh, the whole idea was to get innovative ideas and products out and in use and best practices. And uh, there was a significant portion of the FAST Act in the legislation that talks about everyday counts. As a matter of fact, there's quite a bit of money to Federal Highway Administration from this bill going to that effort. In the pavement preservation part of this, there is a EDC-4, which is pavement preservation, and there are a number of uh, summits that are going to be scheduled between now and December in the U.S. Those summits are essentially for DOT and FHWA personnel 
to talk about various treatments and activities. There will also be public webinars, and you can go to the Federal Highway website and get the dates and locations of those webinars as well as those summits. Again, the summits are going to be invitation only, whereas the webinars are, are public. Uh, accelerated implementation and deployment of pavement technologies program is another section in the bill. And you can see there's a, a 12 million annually uh, innovative pavement technologies. Um, let's see. So let's look at the fun part of the FAST Act. And that is the revenue stream, the good and the bad, and probably could add the ugly to that. Um, because like everything else that comes out of Washington, there's always a, a few things here and there that give you cause for concern. It's estimated right now that over the five-year life of the bill, that the Highway Trust Fund tax receipts, user fees, will be $208 or $208 billion over the five-year period. That's the estimate of what's going to end up in the Highway Trust Fund. However, that's not enough to pay for the plan. And an additional authorization, in other words, general fund transfers from the Treasury will be $78 billion over that life of the bill as well. So here we have user fees that are resolved from gas taxes, if you will, uh, are going to infuse the, Federal High the Highway Trust Fund at the es estimated amount of $208 billion over that five-year period but we've also required to get $75 billion from the general fund. As you can imagine, general funds and DOT folks just know better, much better than I do, you're fighting with everybody else, whether it's agriculture or whether you name it, in the general fund area to try to get money and, and so forth. There's also a, a requirement that any transfers from the general fund have to be made up by losing it someplace else. It's not just, okay, we're gonna give you 75, 78 billion. We've gotta find 78 billion somewhere else in order to be able to give you that money. Well, I call it in Washington parlance funny money because uh, part of that 78 billion is gonna come from the Federal Reserve. I, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't know that the Federal Reserve had anything to do with transportation funding, but I guess it's good that they have some money laying around that they can, we can actually use in, in this bill. But th there, are there are six or seven issues like that of where this money is coming from. And what that means is it's a one-time thing. In 2020, that money doesn't exist anymore. You have to have, have to find money again for the Highway Trust Fund because they have to be paid for those, those transfers. So. Um, in the FAST Act, another little interesting tidbit is the fact that the transfer will be generated over a 10-year period for a five-year bill. Only in Washington can those numbers make sense. Okay. I don't quite get how that happens, but nonetheless, that's, that's what the situation is. So. It's estimated that the general fund transfers uh, under the current spending level has increased from 2008. Now, this was be, this is that right at the end of Safety Lou and all those continuing re resolutions to $65 billion coming out of the general fund. In other words, the Highway Trust Fund, as it was originally envisioned, is set up for users' fees. The last time it was increased was 1993 at 18.3 cents per gallon is what all of us, when we travel the national highway system in this country, we pay about 50 cents a day to drive on that road. Where, do I, where would I get those numbers? If you drive 20,000 miles a year and you get 20 miles a gallon in your car, you buy 1,000 gallons of gas, that's $180 a year in user fees. Divide that through by 365 and you get up a little less than 50 cents a day. Last Starbucks I bought, I kind of liked my coffee cold. It was four dollars and thirty cents. You know, it's, uh, that was probably about twenty-five dollars a gallon, right? I I don't know. It's a little cup. <laughs> Any rate, uh, you know, there's it's a significant difference. And again, in that period from 16 to 20, we're looking at 65 billion. 
And it's estimated when we get to 2026 that it's going to be $113 billion short. And so the, the whole issue with the FAST Act is that, yes, it does give you a good planning time frame, gives you the opportunity to get some money to do some of the things you want to do. But the bottom line is that we really have not faced the issue yet in transportation as to how to adequately fund it. And, and where is the money going to come from? And so in the short term, as I said, uh, there are some significant things that help. Um, obviously, the, the idea of, of transparency in terms of, of, of pavement conditions and asset management conditions and so forth, uh, it was probably a long, long time coming. I don't think a lot of people are arguing that that's a bad idea. Uh, there will be probably a lot of uh, feelings about what eventually comes out in the rulemaking in terms of particularly in terms of the pavement conditions. Um, the other issue in relationship to that is uh, how are these things going to be measured? Do we have uh, the same equipment all over the country? Do we have calibration sites? Do we have all, all those things that go into that little aspect of it in terms of uh, the pavement performance measures? Um, not that they can't be settled, but it, it'll raise some questions before it's all over with. However, uh, as I prepared these slides last week, uh, the funding was set to, to uh, expire tomorrow. In other words, if Congress didn't do something by tomorrow, uh, the federal government would be shut down. Now, there's a lot of people think that's not a bad idea. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, uh, it's probably not, not very good for the country for a lot of reasons. So there needed to be a continuing resolution, one of those things that said, okay, we'll keep the funding at these levels, kick it down the road until sometime. So that happened last night. Uh, Congress, uh, uh, the House last night, passed a continuing resolution bill. Uh, the Senate had passed it earlier in the day. So now we get till December 9th before we get another issue of shutting down the government. And so who knows what's gonna happen. Uh, there are a lot of issues uh, regarding it, uh, not least of which is, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about this morning a little bit is that there's some people, it's in the act, as part of the government spending plan was the whole idea of the internet address issue and uh, the fact that uh, turning it over to the UN uh, instead of having the US government run it uh, is an issue and some people don't think that's a very good idea. That's just one of many, many things. Water supply in Flint, Michigan is another part of the debate of what's going on. How much are we gonna fund for, for the disease caused by the, by the mosquitoes uh, hitting? How about flood control and flood damage in Louisiana? All of those things are all part of this whole mix about how we actually fund and, and do the, some of the things we wanna do in the country that affect the transportation bill in one, one way, shape, or form. And in addition to that, if because it's a continuing resolution, you'll see that uh, Congress is going to withhold a billion dollars from the FAST Act until they pass a, nine, a 2017 funding package. Well, that might never happen in 2017, actually, but that's all part of the mystique of, of what I'm trying to paint here. So the long term, the FAST Act expires. Rescission of state contract authority at the end of FAST Act will, will take another $7 billion out of the Highway Trust Fund. And when it, as I said before, when it expires, it'll be $113 billion short. So solutions for fully funding the Highway Trust Fund are now under discussion, but they have been for a while. How about tax reform? A, put this part of the tax reform package. You probably read in the paper the idea that a, a lot of US companies are taking their profits and keeping them overseas so they don't have to pay the 35% tax uh, burden to bring them back into this country. There's been a lot of discussion about tax reform, reducing that formula to say 15% instead of 25 or 35 or whatever it is. So that's part of the whole deal is if we can get a tax reform package in place, which a lot of people seem to want to do, um, it may address some of the funding issues that we have. User fee increase. Uh, those of you who, who follow politics in this country, 
know that uh, the Republican platform that came out of the convention said no new taxes, no gas tax increase, and no vehicle miles tax. Not going to happen. Now, a couple weeks later, the Democrats meet in Philadelphia, and they say, we want to put this big transportation infrastructure plan in place. They didn't quite get to how they're going to pay for it, but that's beside the point. At least there's a lot of discussion about the infrastructure needs in the country, which I, I think is, uh, is, is great and needs to be. There's been a lot of discussion in a couple of pilot states. I know Oregon's one of them, uh, dealing with the vehicle miles driven fee. A lot of feeling about that in terms of privacy. Uh, it's nobody's business uh, to know where I am right now in my car. However, if I have my cell phone on, everybody knows where I am right now. So, I mean, it's kind of one of those deals where yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a deal. It's a something you have to be concerned about. Privacy, of course, but we need to be realistic about it as well. So the Miles Driven Fee, Oregon is supposed to report, I think, in the next several months on their, um, what they've seen and, and what they've done. I think a couple other states, I'm not sure Caltrans or somebody else in the West has done it. Another, something that's been discussed recently is a virtual mileage vehicle tax. Um, that's kind of an interesting twist on it. it. It really gets back to the source of energy, so it gets back to the refiner, for example, uh, where they would pay a fee based on some formula that the Treasury Department would set up with the Transportation Department that would indicate that, well, this is the estimated amount of miles that have been traveled this year, and therefore the fee will be X. Uh, what does that do? It, it gets away from Congress having to go back to their constituents and say, I voted to raise the user fee, no, call that a gas tax, by two or three cents. That They don't have to do that if they get this virtual thing. Not quite sure how that all works out. I know some industry folks have been actively working on it. Uh, the American Highway Users Alliance, for one, along with some of the other ARPA and some other organizations have been at it. Uh, under others, there are some in Congress that feel this whole thing ought to be turned back to the states. No highway trust fund, no, no federal highway administration, just turn it all back to the states, let them do it. And having been involved in building a lot of the interstate, not a lot of the interstate, but some interstate in Pennsylvania in my career, I just can't picture what it would be like if each state had its own way. You'd go to the Ohio border or New Jersey border or New York border, or you, who knows what you'd run into if it was all helter-skelter. So I think there's, there's a bit, much uh, to say about the Highway Trust Fund and why it's important for consistency, continuity, and other things. But there are some in Congress that feel it ought to be turned back to the states. Let's, let's get rid of it. So what can you do? Well, I have here at the top, provided you're a US citizen and eligible to vote, and frankly, you don't even need to be eligible to vote just a U.S. citizen, you can take the opportunity to educate your congressperson. And you're thinking, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> there's no way I'm going to do that. You know, I work for DOT. I, there's no way, no way that I'm going to do that. Well, as a private citizen, you do have the right to contact your congressperson and tell them in local terms why you think it's important to keep funding the Highway Trust Fund, why it's important for the commerce of this country to do so. And um, there are a, a number of reasons why to keep that Highway Trust Fund solvent. I've, I've covered several of them. But I think it's really important. It's something we, as citizens, don't think we, I don't think we do it very often. And frankly, uh, when I started going up on Capitol Hill, I wasn't very, <clears throat> uh, positive about the whole thing myself, but after 200 and some visits, well, I guess uh, I know my way around up there a little bit. Uh, but nonetheless, it's not intimidating. As a matter of fact, those of you who are going to be attending TRB in January, if you want to visit your congressperson, let me know. We can make those arrangements. We'll get with their scheduler and get you a visit. How long? 20 minutes. You sit down in a little, little office and there's a clock. It's just like on TV, you know, 
19, 19, 18, goes down to zero, and you get your 20 minutes. I, I learned how to build a road in 15, so I mean, if, if you, guys, you guys can do that for sure to, to, to get an impression on why this is important. You don't know who your representative is? Hmm, well, I got a handy dandy book here that tells you every senator and congressperson in the U.S. from every state. So you can't leave here without knowing who they are if you don't know who they are. Um, you don't know quite what to put in a letter? We'll write it for you. Uh, and it won't be from an industry perspective. It will be from a perspective of saying it's really important for this country to have a very, very reliable infrastructure system. And therefore, pavements and bridges, et cetera, et cetera, are part of that. And why it's important that we have a world-class system that we can actually do some of the things we want to do. So if you're not quite sure what to put in a letter, we can put you something together. As I say, if you can't write, see me. I'll, I'll be glad to do that, too. And uh, you need a letter to sign, we'll, we'll be glad to do it for you. So. That's the conversation I started to have. Uh, you may have some questions or observations or whatever you might have. For, I'll be here th on the rest of the morning at least. Um, but as was initially started out on Monday morning, uh, I'm a senior consultant with Fugro. And those of you in the consulting business know that if you're not billable, you don't get paid, right? So if you don't have contracts to work on, I know I have one now, an NCHRP project we're working on, but uh, for the most part, it's been a few lean years. So I took on the added responsibility of being the executive director of, of FP2, which uh, is an organization that's been around since 1992 in various forms. We were known as the foundation for pavement preservation for a long time. And for the most part, our, our, our focus has been in the pavements area but we also recognize that uh, while we're out doing the things that we do, we need to be talking about infrastructure and all the things that make it up. So thank you for your attendance and thank you for being here. And I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions for Jim? I might also add before the questions start, I'm not an expert in uh, these bills. Um, I know about them. I know what's in there regarding some of the issues I talked about. But I made a note to myself last night. The FAST Act was 1,347 pages. So I have no clue about what's on every page. Uh, what's simpler about that, the MAP 21 was only 577. So That's a lot please. Of uh, does the FAST Act? Uh, have a provision for moving freight from the roads to the railways? That's the first question. And the second one, on the funding of the gas tax, did they take into consideration uh, that the uptake of electric cars could be much higher than uh, is currently forecast? Two things. Uh, there have been, the, the FAST Act doesn't specifically designate moving it to rail from highways but there have been, last week there was a hearing in Washington about that very subject. The Secretary of Transportation of Pennsylvania was, was one of the witnesses. There were several people from uh, railroad companies and, and so forth who provided input to Congress to say, we need to be moving you know, a lot of the freight off of roadways into, into the rail system. The unfortunate part about it is uh, in this country, at least, uh, the continuity of the, of the rail system is not in the best situation. Probably, you know, the best is in the Northeast with the Amtrak, but the rest of it's kind of piecemeal in a lot of senses. So, um, in terms of the gas tax, gas tax electric, cars. electric cars, that is one of the, one of the reasons for the, all the activity with going to some kind of a vehicle mileage fee. Um, because, uh, like it or not, I think autonomous vehicles and, and electric cars and so forth, I probably won't be used extensively while I'm still around, but it'll be, it's the way, it's gonna happen. 
Um, so there needs to be some, some mechanism to be able to take care of that. Uh, damage to uh, pavements, for example, from vehicles is, you could say, well, it's not that much compared to a truck, 9,000 to one or something like that, but that's beside the point. There, there needs to be some mechanism in order to take care of that, and that's what's being looked at in these vehicle mileage applications. Um, how successful they're going to be, uh, the more they're virtual is probably going to be more successful. In other words, instead of coming right out and saying we're for a fee increase, and it'll be this much, it'll probably be something less than that. Any other questions? Well, it looks like Jim has challenged us to, to get involved politically, which is, kind of goes against a lot of our, our upbringing in state DOTs, but uh, I think for the protection of our infrastructure. We all need to talk to our family members and uh, try to see if we can't get more people involved in, in saving the infrastructure. Let's give Jim a big round of applause. Thank you.